Okay, I spent the first lecture talking about the phylum Arthropoda, um, but there are some arthropods that are non-insects, okay? So arthropods have jointed legs, okay? Pod meaning foot, um, and things like arachnids, water mites, and spiders are non-insect arthropods. Columbulins or springtails are also non-insect arthropods. Um, there are truly aquatic mites. Most aquatic spiders though are not truly aquatic, but they kind of carry bubbles of water around with them like this diving bell spider. Basically they're scuba divers. They bring their own air with them. And there are both aquatic and terrestrial springtails. And then we have crustaceans. They're also arthropods. Okay, they have jointed legs and things, things like crayfish, amphipods, isopods, tadpole shrimp. Um, a lot of them are important detritivores, so they eat detritus. Okay, um, and then there are zombie scuds. So scuds are, are these little guys, amphipods, okay, little crustaceans, but they can be infected by the spiny headed worm. And here you can see a scud with the spiny headed worm has this red spot. And what happens is that once they're infected by this um, worm, they stop, you know, kind of rooting around in the detritus in the bottom of a stream and they start swimming up near the surface and bouncing around, showing off this red spot where birds and fish will then prey on them. And so this guy is trying to get into a bird or fish host. So another zombie, right? So parasites can create these zombies that make, make the organisms do something they wouldn't normally do. Um, so they infect a host, sometimes they alter the host's body shape, often they alter their behavior, and then the behavior then benefits the parasite, usually to the detriment or death sometimes of the host. Um, and then the parasite gets to reside in its next host. So parasites often have these complex life histories where they need to be in two or more different hosts over their life cycle. And the last um, crustaceans I'll talk about are zooplankton. They're tiny little crustaceans. They tend to float in the water column, more commonly found in lakes and the ocean, but sometimes found in rivers as well. Um, their carapaces are made of chitin, but also of calcium which is true for all crustaceans. Um, they often have eggs that are resistant to drying out or desiccation, okay? So some really cool different kinds. We have clodosterans, copepods, and then ostracods, which look like little clear jelly beans, but then they open up and have little legs. So adorable, right? Okay, so, and there's another video here um, that I'll have to link for you. So moving on to evolution and biogeography of these organisms. So first of all, we have the fossil record and we're lucky we work with insects because parts of insects um, do fossilize. Um, a fossil is any physical evidence from the past and the fossil record is the total collection of fossils that have been found throughout the world. Fossils form though in a variety of ways. So the first is an intact fossil, something where um, decomposition doesn't occur and the organic remains are preserved intact. So things that are found like in peat bogs are sometimes intact fossils. We have compression fossils. These are what we're mostly going to see with insects is when sediments accumulate on top of the organism and it becomes cemented into the stone and then it compresses into a thin film that's no longer the organism but now made out of stone. There are also casts where the organisms decompose and the hole that's remained is filled with minerals. Um, a lot of shelled marine organisms are cast fossils. Permineralized fossils are things where the things decompose very slowly, like petrified wood, and their cells are replaced by minerals. And then traces are basically evidence of the organism, like a footprint, um, sometimes a tube, like an insect or like a, a worm's tube casing can be, become a trace fossil. All right, so, but there are limitations to the fossil record and we'll see why we don't have fossils of everything. Um, there's habitat bias. So things that live in particular habitats become, are more commonly fossilized. So beaches and swamps, um, burrowing organisms have a better chance of being fossilized than other organisms. So we're pretty lucky it's freshwater. Um, a lot of organisms live in deltas with sedimentary deposits coming out, estuaries, things like that. Um, there's also taxonomic and tissue bias. So organisms with hard parts like exoskeletons for insects 
are more likely to decay slowly and become fossils, so that's good. But we're not going to find fossils of like really um, marshmallowy organisms like fly larvae and things like that. There's a temporal bias, meaning that more recent fossils are more common than ancient ones. And then there's an abundance bias, meaning that organisms that are more abundant are more likely to, to leave evidence. And so again, we're lucky with insects because insects are so abundant. All right, so here's some insect fossils. Many um, insect habitats um, were actually not likely to form fossils, but um, a lot of our aquatic habitats were. So many ancient lineages also went extinct, so it's hard to match them to existing species. But here we have a fossil stonefly, a fossil hemipteran, and a fossil odonate or dragonfly. These are all about 125 year old compression fossils that were found in China. Um, and often the dating is difficult, but we can use things like isotopes and the age of layers in the um, nearby region to help us understand the dates. So here's some 230 year old mites that have been found in amber. Um, some of the oldest insects are from amber deposits. And for a lot of time people thought, well, that won't work for aquatic organisms, but it actually does. This was a study from 2007 showing that in swamps, we get these really cool um, kind of bulges of um, resin underwater from swampy trees. And so we can get a lot of aquatic organisms out of these resin deposits um, from ancient swamps, which is really cool. We also find some insects from things like the Labria tar pits. Lots of lake dwelling insects were trapped in the tar. Lots of things like beetles and hemipterans and mollusks. Um, especially the Nodonectidae, the Bellostomatidae, and the Geridae, um, along with things like frogs and fish and lizards and birds. So here's, you know, what like the tar pit might have looked like um, before, you know, it came to a place where we find fossils. Okay, so here is the geologic um, time period going from the present back to the Hadean. Okay, and then this is the, the Precambrian. Um, here is, uh, sorry, where, where are we here? Oh yeah, that's the present. This is just a, another way to look at it, basically. Um, oh, sorry, all of those rainbow colors up there are spread out right here. That's what's going on. And what I want to point you to is here's where the first insects came in, uh, in the Devonian, and here's where the first flowering plants came in. And so there's a lot of time between the insects and the plants. Um, but once plants arose, lots of really cool interactions between insects and plants, uh, flowering plants in particular, were able to develop. These are the locations of major extinction events, the six major extinctions. And so uh, we can see that insects have made it through five of the six extinctions. Um, insects arose from hexapods in the late Silurian around 405 to 425 million years ago. And there was a massive radiation, that means like a di diversification um, of insects during the Carboniferous between 280 and 345 million years ago that gave rise to insects as we know them today. The earliest insects, some of the earliest were the mayflies and the dragonflies and damselflies, which is cool because some of the earliest insects were aquatic organisms. Um, and this radiation then continued in the Permian um, where we started seeing plecopterans, stoneflies, megalopterans, hemipterans, and coleopterans. So then these guys started coming onto the scene. I use the word radiation as an adaptive radiation. I also talked about solar radiation, right? There's differences there. So adaptive radiation is a period of the rapid production of many species. And here we have um, lakes in Lake Victoria and Lake Tanganyika and Lake, um, yeah, these are both Lake Tanganyika, or Lake Malawi. Um, and you can see that there was amazing radiation of these fish species called cichlids. Hundreds and hundreds of different species of cichlids arose in these very ancient rift lakes in Africa. Okay, species um, tend to have a wide range of adaptive forms, and then we can find them in the fossil record. So there's evidence of these radiation periods in the fossil record. There's also a period of gigantism. So this is called a griffin fly, and this is how big it would be compared to us. Um, and there's, there are periods of gigantism in the fossil record. And it was really common in the late Permian, 
and we think it had to do with higher oxygen production at that time. So there was more oxygen in the atmosphere, which means there was more reaeration between the atmosphere and the water. And so there was higher oxygen in the dissolved in the water and oxygen at those levels could be toxic to aquatic larvae. So there was this pressure to produce bigger and bigger aquatic larvae that produce bigger and bigger aquatic or um, adults basically. And there's a really cool video that you can watch about that. So then we hit the age of the dinosaurs and the Triassic, and we have this continued insect radiate. We just have insects doing their thing and adapting in all of these different geologic time periods. Things like the caddisflies and moths and ants and wasps and the fly, the true flies, all came about around the same time as the dinosaurs. And then we have flower and plants coming on the scene like I talked about, and a lot of insects began co-evolving with these amazing new resources that were flowers. So by about 66 million years ago, we have all major insect orders um, on Earth. And here's a picture showing um, when these different organisms arose. Um, and basically you can see, it's, it's kind of hard to see, but I'll put this paper as a link if you want to dig into it. You can see the Carboniferous, we have the dragonflies coming online, and then we have the mayflies and stoneflies, and then we have moths and caddisflies. Um, coming into the Jurassic period. So we can use new phylogenetic analyses to kind of corroborate what we see, what we think we see in the fossil record.